I hate my father. Everyone has their own relationship with their father. But if you had asked me about my relationship with my father, my answer for most of my life would have been, I hate my father. And we don't have a relationship. It's 1977, a 14-year-old, Franz Velasco, my father, leave his home country of Colombia on a banana boat with a couple of cans of tuna and a jug of water. Destination, Tampa, Florida. He spent some time there before making his way up to New York, where he met my beautiful mother. She taught him how to speak English. They fell in love and got married. Voila! <laughs> Happily ever after, right? Wrong. The social climate my father left in Colombia more than 40 years ago consisted of drugs, violence, and fast money. That reality will soon overtake my family. When my mother got pregnant with my oldest brother, this forced my father to want to provide for his family. And to do so, he started importing cocaine. Turns out, he was actually pretty good at his job. <laughs> so much so, he said he was making over $100,000 a week. And some people gave him the nickname Kingpin, a real-life version of Tony Montana from the movie Scarface. Unfortunately, he got addicted to the same poison that he was pushing. And so did my mother, under his violent pressure. People often say, no one put a gun to your head and made you do this. Well, that wasn't the case with my mother. He actually threatened to take her life if she didn't partake in the drugs with him. Because of his addiction, they had many verbal and physical altercations. During one altercation, he beat my mother so badly and dropped her off at the hospital curb. It was then doctors found out that she was pregnant with her second child. They begged her, please do not have this baby. They said, Audrey, under no circumstances should you deliver this baby. This baby will be born with a number of disabilities because of all the trauma that you have endured. Against medical advice, my mother delivered me <laughs> on February 22nd, 1985 <laughs> in Monticello, New York. Two years later, my mother would grab my brother and I to send us to Rins, Georgia to be raised by our grandparents. While she got herself together and got back on her feet. Now, they weren't rich in money, but they were very rich in love. During that time, my father would get caught by authorities after they found over 100 kilos of cocaine in the trunk of his car, which led to his arrest and imprisonment for over 11 years. I remember vividly going to visit him in prison. And leaving there with so many feelings and emotions that I really couldn't explain. His absence throughout my childhood would have a major impact on my life. I got in fights in school, even tried to be the class clown to get attention. I also started drinking and smoking at the age of 13 to cope with him not being there. I learned a lot of things from my teachers, from my coaches, and even my church, but never how to deal with my emotions positively. Instead, I carried them around for the majority of my life. That's a long time to carry around hate. On the outside, I was a happy, successful guy, but on the inside, I was a man 
desperate for change. The change will come when I turn 35 years old. I noticed something different with my walking buddy, Brad. I said, hey, man, what's going on in your life? I see you have a different aura about yourself. He said, Fernando, man, I recently started going to therapy. And it has made a major change for my life. Change for the good. Now, Brad was a friend that I admired deeply, and I had a lot of respect for. Brad was also the first black man that I knew that was going to therapy. I didn't think black men like myself or Brad go to therapy. I didn't want anyone to judge me or think I was crazy. But I mustered up the energy and asked for a referral. During that first session, my therapist looked at me dead in my eye. She said, Fernando, you have trauma. I said, whoo. <laughs> what do you mean? Never had I put Fernando and trauma in the same sentence. But at that point in my life, since childhood, my life had been full of it. And I had to release it and figure out a way to get past it. I had to pull back the layers one by one. I had to learn myself better. I had to stop blaming my father for not being there. I had to open my heart more. I had to be vulnerable. I had to learn how to forgive. And forgiveness is not just for the other person, but it's also for yourself. See, forgiveness is what sets us free from the trauma and help us mend the relationship for a better future. For me, I had to first forgive myself. I had to accept the fact that I did want a relationship with my father. And I had to be willing to start from ground zero. I had to put in the time and the effort. I also had to understand that I wanted to ask some questions. And some questions, I may not get the answers that I want. And some questions may be uncomfortable. But I knew that I had to go through that process. Our reconnection actually started in 2003. My father had been released from prison about five years beforehand and was deported to his home country of Colombia, but later moved to Sweden for a fresh and legit start. We started out talking on the telephone, and it was over those calls where I would share my life milestones and some of my achievements. It was also during that time that I was sending him some VHS tapes of my football games. I know that show my age a little. <laughs> but we enjoyed those times. He enjoyed those times. I enjoyed talking to him as well. In 2009, we took it a step farther. Since he was deported and not allowed to come to the States, we would meet yearly at a destination outside of the U.S. And during those early years, I noticed, I said, he really is human. And he was doing the best that he knew how. I also came to understand that he witnessed his father abuse his mother and thought that abuse was a sign that you love someone. But I knew it was another step that I had to take. I still didn't feel right. I still felt the empty hole. So I got on a plane and went to Sweden and spent a week at his home. 
It was our best visit up to that point. We embraced each other. We laughed. But most of all, we talked. Sitting on his back porch, sharing a real father-son moment was something I always dreamed about. Fast forward. My wife and I got married last year. And we decided to have the wedding in Dominican Republic so he could attend. Seeing him sitting there in his suit supporting me was a dream come true. He even got to meet my son for the first time. Now, I realize how much a better father I can be to my son because I have my father back in my life. Since forgiving my father, I feel free. I feel light. I don't feel that empty hole anymore. Now, as you can hear, my forgiveness journey took years to get to that point. So I'm not going to ask you to leave here and immediately forgive the person that have wronged you. But I will challenge you to dig deep and think about that person who you have the ill will against. And I challenge you to find someone who you can confide in. It may be a friend, a close loved one, or even a therapist. Talk to them. And then when you're ready, when you're ready, send that email, send that text message, or make that phone call. Whatever you can do to spark the conversation. You will be amazed. You will be amazed at what forgiveness can do for you. I'm going to leave you with this. Roughly 90% of the people in the world admit needing more forgiveness in their lives. Don't be a part of the majority. Join me in the 10% and learn to forgive. I promise you, forgiveness sets you free. Thank you.